So it's time for our first keynote speaker, Solomon Aswab. You're an economist from FIO in Rome. Very welcome. You're an expert in many things, um, amongst them climate smart agriculture and the impact for food security and also social protection. Um, very welcome. The floor is yours. Okay. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me uh, to give this uh, short talk on, on uh, a topic that we are working at FAO. Uh, I would like to give a very short talk on the role of cash transfer program uh, generally on economic activities, and I'll try to make particular emphasis on agricultural development in African countries. Uh, the outline of my presentation, I'll try to give you some background about the, the cash transfer program overall in Africa, the evolution, the context, and the design. And then I'll give you some insight about why we should expect uh, productive impact from these cash transfer programs. What are the intuition? What are the economics underpinning, the theoretical underpinning behind this, this such kind of uh, policy and instrument? And then I'll try to show you some evidence that we have been working at FAO and also uh, with other partners and different academia. And then finally give you a short remark. Uh, if you look at the past decade, as you all might know, we, we saw an expansion of the government-run cash transfer program uh, in a number of sub-Saharan African countries. Uh, approximately about half of the countries in sub-Saharan Africa have some sort of uh, government-run cash transfer program. And there are other countries that have been supported by multilateral uh, agencies or NGOs. So some of these programs are national, and others are scaling up while the others are at the, at the pilot stage. And as you could imagine, most of the, the beneficiaries of these programs are uh, based in rural setting and mostly engaged in agriculture. Of course, there are beneficiaries from urban cities, but most of the, the Households in African setting, they live in rural areas, so uh, by de facto, the beneficiaries are based in rural areas. So what is particular about the cash transfer program in African countries? We know a lot about the cash transfer programs in Latin American countries. There is some element that distinguishes the cash transfer in Africa vis-a-vis the Latin American context. One of the, the peculiar nation is that it evolves around the HIV AIDS kind of issues. Most of these beneficiaries are families, households, individuals that are affected by HIV AIDS. In other words, they are economically vulnerable, socially vulnerable. And most of the community, these communities are also characterized by widespread poverty and they rely mostly on subsistence agriculture and informal economy. So if you think about this community, the way to exit poverty, the way to improve their livelihood, you don't expect them through the classical uh, neoclassical economics way through market participation and so forth. So the markets are very developed and they are characterized by risk, risk, risk. So there's a lot of risk involved. So I would say one of the difference between the Latin American case and this is these families are characterized by high risk and vulnerability. The second element is related to this institution, the capacity of the institution to implement this program and with the exception of southern African countries like South Africa, Botswana, Namibia, uh, there is less fiscal space in most of the sub-Saharan African countries. They have limited budgets to fund the program, and then donors play a very strong role in most of the cases. And among the policymakers, also there is a lack of consensus about the role of cash transfer program in the overall development context. And the institutional capacity to implement these programs are also uh, pretty weak. And in some cases, the supply of the service, like education and health, are also pretty weak. So another element that differentiates Latin American case from African case is that the institutional capacity is pretty weaker in, in most African countries. So if you look at the design of the programs, again, we see a difference between the Latin American vis-a-vis the African case. In some cases, there is a universal program, like the child, the all-age pension child grants in South Africa, Namibia and mostly Southern African nation. And then, but in most of the African countries, it's kind of targeted programs. They focus on the ultra poor, they focus on households that are labor constraints, households with orphan vulnerable children, and some other specific vulnerabilities. And in some cases, we also see uh, cash for work 
for those families, individuals who can't able to work. And also, one of the things that differentiate from the Latin American case and African case, in terms of targeting the, the, the households, the community played a very strong, strong role. There is, most of the part, there is community targeting involved, and most of the cash transfer are unconditional. They're not conditioned on the families to send their kids to school or something like that. So there are some sort of soft condition and strong message, but for the most part, they are unconditional. And we also see, like uh, the, the keynote, uh, the first speaker said, there are some cash transfer programs that are linked to productive activities. For instance, like the public work focused on agricultural rehabilitation that's going on in Somalia, FAO is involved strongly in that project. And also the famous Ethiopian Productive Safety Net Program, which complement cash transfers with some other agricultural packages. And also in Rwanda, some cash transfer linked with small business loans. But with the exception of this, the perception out there is that these cash transfer programs don't have any economic or productive impact. So they are considered like a free handout uh, you give for free, and you don't expect any sort of linkages to the productive activities or uh, economic uh, progress. So we like to look at why we should expect why we should expect some sort of productive impact from this cash transfer program. What are our intuition says, what are some of the theoretical, uh, small theoretical, economical, theoretical concepts says about the role of cash transfer in productive activities. Let me show you like five plus one ways in which cash, tran cash transfer programs can have a productive impact and at the end then improve the resilience of the, the households or families. The first thing one we all know is that there is a very strong evidence that cash transfer program can improve the human capital. When the farmers receive the cash, they will spend on consumption that would have an impact on the nutritional status. They will spend some of the money for the health services, and then that would have an impact on the health status, and they will use some of the money to send the kids to school, which has an impact on the educational tournament. And then it would enhance productivity and then improve the employability of those individuals. And this is basically the classical objectives of cash transfer in most of, most of the countries. And these are also the underlying rational for the conditional cash transfer program in Latin American countries. So there is no debate about, about the role of cash transfer in terms of improved human capital. But the second way we think, like FAO is trying to make a, a, an argument and try to work on is it, cash transfer can help also in changing the behavior of the household that could that induce changes in productive activities. Now, if we think in a normal economics way that the, the market and the rural areas are functioning well, there is no credit constraint, there is no capital constraint, the farmers can access credit, and then there is no economic reason to expect change in productive activity because of cash transfer program. But as we know, the markets are not functioning, there is a credit constraint, they are often uh, constrained by liquidity. So in that case, when you inject a cash into a household, we would expect that cash to relax the liquidity constraints and help the families to change their production behavior in terms of using some of the money to invest in productive activities, using some modern inputs, buying labor, invest some of the money in productive assets like farm implements, livestock, and some inventory. And they might decide also to get engaged in, in, in terms of investing in new crops technique and new line of product, or they might use some of the, the money to start a new business, get involved in off-farm wage labor, and so on. So that's the second element I would like to raise. It would change the behavior of the household in terms of their decision making. Another element is related to is risk and shock. Again, the insurance market is not there, so cash transfer can help us an insurance mechanism so that the farmers, the households can rely on that cash and make some adjustment in their day-to-day -day activity. It can help to avoid detrimental risk coping strategies like distress, sale of productive assets, uh, children's school dropouts, and risky income generating activities, as you could imagine. And also it could help the farmers to kind of uh, abandon the concept of safety first or it first, and then help them to take risk. So that would help to avoid risk adverse production strategy. They could help engage in a specialization or diversification. In a nutshell, 
the cash injection into an, an household could help them to reading about the risk strategies. They could more be open to take risk and, and then that they could improve their, their livelihood. This again at a conceptual level. The empirical uh, issue is another question, but at the conceptual level one would think uh, in this way too. Another idea is related to the informal insurance mechanism. It relieved the pressure within the informal uh, insurance mechanism within a society. When they get the, the, the cash, that could reduce the burden on social networks, uh, the local network, network of reciprocal relationship. It could rejuvenate social networks. It could allow beneficiaries to participate in social networks. It allowed non-beneficiaries to direct their, their resources. So uh, one would expect cash transfer to, to kind of uh, relieve the pressure. Again, this is an empirical question. If I tell you one example, uh, it could vary from countries to country. We have been in Ethiopia once. We are evaluating the, the northern part, the Tigrayan uh, cash transfer program, and we have been talking with the, with the community leader and the, the, the task force there. And one of their concerns is that when you bring a cash transfer program like that, they are worried that that could destroy uh, the informal uh, uh, sharing arrangement within the society. There is a very strong uh, informal insurance mechanism within, the, within that community. They help each other a lot. So when they get the cash, that, may, that, that mechanism may be destroyed. So it's not like a universal kind of make the case, but in many other countries, this is the case. So again, this is an empirical question where it applies, where it doesn't apply. Another element, uh, maybe the last element, is the local economic impact. The significant injection of a cash into a local economy can create a multiplier effect and boost the, the local economy within, within a community. I'll come to this a little bit later. How does a cash transfer program uh, stimulate the local economy? What are the mechanisms behind? I'll just give you some highlight at the later and show you some results about that. So if you put these five of them together, at the end of the day, this could build the capacity of a family, the capacity of a household, a capacity of the community to adapt to the changing climate. So there's a direct linkage between climate change adaptation and a cash transfer program. In the literature, you really see a very, uh, it's not there often to link cash transfer with, with changing climates and how they adapt to the climate change. And we are trying, and I feel trying to make that linkage also uh, how a social protection program can help families build the capacity and then they adapt to a climate change. Okay, saying this much about uh, the, the background and the intuition, what evidence do we have? What does the evidence say? As I said before, uh, there is a lot of evidence on human capital. We have a lot of uh, published papers, especially in the Latin American countries, the impact on poverty, food security, food consumption, nutrition, health, education. There is a very strong evidence that cash transfer has a positive linkage. We have very uh, few studies on risk and shocks, and there are very few studies on productive activities, the multiplier effect, the social network, and the climate change adaptation. So if you look at the African countries, you look at this figure and you would say, wow. Most people think cash transfer program is not that much strong in African countries. But if we really look at closely the cash transfer program that's going on in African countries, these are really huge cash transfer program. There are about 20 impact evaluation going on at the moment. We call this first and second generation of impact evaluation in about 14 countries. So these programs are often designed in an experimental way, in randomized control trial way, and some are a quasi-experimental way. So we feel like that the impact evaluation that's going on in African countries exceeded the Latin American case. When we cite cash transfer program, the classical example is the Latin American case, the progress in Mexico, the, the opportunities in, 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 in a number of uh, Latin American countries in Brazil, Nicaragua, and so on. But if you look at the moment, the, the African case, we feel that the impact valuation are exceeded the Latin American case. So we do have a lot of evidence. From the first generation impact evaluation, uh, there is a recent, uh, recent special issue paper that came out in Journal of Development Effectiveness. Uh, Marie is not here, but she was also one of the co-author of the paper. So that lay out a number of findings from a number of African countries. I would uh, recommend you guys to refer to those papers if you need more insight on that. But the ones that are lighted with red, those are like the second generation of impact evaluation that are going on at the moment. 
I'm not going into the detail of what these programs are, but uh, if you look at the main evaluation topic of the first generation of impact evaluation, like I said, it's, re it's related with food security, with consumption, with health, with education and targeting. But in this case of second generation, what is new about the second generation is that there are uh, some very innovative thinking about how could cash transfer program help mitigate HIV risk in terms of sexual behavior and perception? Uh, how does it affect the psychosocial status, the mental health, and the preference? And the first two objectives, we have a colleague from University of North Carolina who is working with us, and, and they are working in that dimension and the health this area. Another issue is about the conditionality. If, like I said, in African countries, there is no conditionality. I mean, do we need a conditionality in a number of these African countries or the non-conditional aspect of the classical or the very good, the good one? We need an empirical evidence on that. The one we are involved in FAO is more on the productive activities than the economic growth, the household level, the community level, the simulation modeling, and the network of reciprocal exchange. So let me give you a little bit about the project we are working in FAO. The project is named as From Protect from protection to production, P2P uh, project, and we are implementing in, in collaboration with UNICEF. <clears throat> so the focus is on understanding the economic impact of cash transfer program. So what we do is we provide technical and an analytical assistance to government agencies carrying out impact evaluation. So our guiding principle is that we kind of piggyback or add value to the existing impact evaluation. Uh, because the existing impact evaluation, they are not primarily designed to evaluate these productive activities. They are primarily designed or uh, they are structured in a way to analyze the nutritional, the health, and the education. So what we do is we go to an impact evaluation and we said we like to piggyback some modules on there and then we try to evaluate the productive activities and so forth. So formally we are working now with about seven countries in sub-Saharan African, uh, African countries and a UNICEF country office are our key partners. So what kind of method do we use to analyze or to address some of the, the, the research question? The first set of analysis is on household decision making. We use pretty strong econometrics modeling. And then the local economic effect, we use uh, what we call the CG modeling, the general equilibrium modeling or so social accounting matrix. And then we also look at the perception of local dynamics via qualitative method. So we use both quantitative and qualitative method to address some of uh, the, the question we want to address. We get the funding from DFID, and the, this is a part of the overarching transfer project. I don't know how many of you heard about transfer project. This is a kind of a network between UNICEF, Save the Children, UK, University of North Carolina, and FAO. So the idea is to promote or to give assistance of cash transfer impact evaluation, help the governments in the design, and so on and so on. So the first set of analysis is the household level impact analysis. As I said, we focus on asset accumulation, risk coping strategy, and then what we do is we kind of prepare a methodological guideline on how one could analyze household level impact of cash transfer program. We design, we pilot, we supervise implementation of additional module, and then taking use of the experimental design of most of the, this program, we conduct some analysis. So what are the, the results? Let me just give you a nutshell about what we found. I mean, uh, I don't go into the detail about how we did the analysis. We used much more really advanced, state-of-the-art uh, quantitative modeling technique to come to this uh, very short uh, summary of those results. What we found in Malawi Social Cash Transfer Program is that we found a very strong evidence that the cash transfer have a positive impact on investment in agricultural assets, including crop implement and livestock. And then most of the beneficiaries, they get the greater share of household consumption from their own production. We use a number of indicators to see whether it has an impact on agriculture. One of the proxy you could use is that they use some of the money to use improved seeds, fertilizer, and so on. They boost their production, and they rely more of the consumption from their home production instead of buying it. And we found that evidence. And another finding we found is that we found a reduced involvement in wage labor by the adults and also child work often. I mean, when you look at this one, you would say, wow, they are not working too much, yeah? That's every time they worry about cash transfer program because they say it could create dependency. But what we found is that they are leaving the, the paid work, and, but they are engaged on their own farm, and that's a very good story. So what we found is there is increased on-farm activity by both adults and children. So these are some of the findings we find from uh, 
uh, from the Malawi one. From the clinic transfer for orphan vulnerable children, we do not find that very strong impact and productive asset. There is kind of a modest impact. There is no systematic uh, evidence that you could say that they are using the money to build their, their, their physical capital. But we found a greater share, the beneficiaries to use a greater share of household con consumption from own production. And we also saw, like the Malawi case, a substitution between wage and non-wage labor intensity. So that means that they leave the wage market, the labor market, they go into their own farm and they involve more on their own farm. And the child labor, we found a large reduction on own farm. And then what is another very interesting uh, finding we find is that the, the female-headed households, they are engaged more on off-farm activities. That's kind of a positive story one could tell. So at the household level, if I say Malawi and Kenya case, that should be enough. Let me show you some of the findings we got in the simulation of the local economy. This is uh, conducted by our colleague, uh, Ed Taylor, I don't know if you know, Professor Ed Taylor from University of California, Davis. So we get some of the funding from the bank, and then we are doing in collaboration of that, that uh, in the collaboration with the old bank. <clears throat> so let me give you a nutshell about how do the local economic effect work generally. I mean, the first thing that you'd expect is you give a cash and then their purchasing power is boosted of that family. And then for a local economy effect to happen, the families have to spend the money. If they don't spend the money, you don't expect the local economy to function. So as beneficiary households spend cash, impact immediately spread outside beneficiary households to other inside and outside village. So when trade happens, you'd expect income multiplier effect. So the families could sell some of, purchase some of the products outside the village, and you could see the money going out outside the village, and you could expect some income multiplier effects outside the village. So in the long run, as the program is scaled up, transfer will have both direct within the treated village and indirect the untreated village throughout the region of implementation. I like this, uh, this kind of grammatic, uh, diagra diagrammatical way of expression that Ed used often. So, let me give you a classical. You see the treated, treatment village and the control village down there. In most of the cases, it's not a universal grant. So there are some villages who receive the cash transfer, some villages who don't receive the cash transfer because the money is not there to give for all who need them. So when you give a cash into a household within that village, the first thing you use is you might invest in their own crop, but they might start to buy some livestock from another, another family in the, next, in, in the neighboring one. So you could see the money start to spread out. They might start to buy some items from the market. And then you could see those guys who got the cash try to reinvest or rebuy into the neighboring households and so on, and the money start to flow through the linkage. I'm using the case of Lesotho in this case. And then there is a feedback mechanism too. When they got some money, they start to buy from the same household who sold to them at the first place. And you see how the money flows within the village. It's a kind of a very good example of looking at the local economic impact. So there is a flow of money from one household to another household and so on. So you could see the, the impact within the treated village or you could see the impact in the untreated village because the money could go from the village that received the cash to the untreated because of the trade and purchases. Now there is one very important thing to, to see here. We are sure that the demand is boosted, yeah? But if the local supply is inelastic, if the, the, the non-beneficiaries are not responding to the demand, then what would happen? Inflation would happen. That's a key concern of cash transfer program. So the non-beneficiaries need to be responsive to the, the additional demand that is created there. If that's not the case, not the case and then we'll have a, a problem with the, with the inflation. So what we found from a Kenya cash transfer in Lesotho child grant program is we found a positive local income multiplier of about 1.02 to 1.57. What does that mean? If you inject a $1 into a local economy, you would get about 1.57 multiplier effect of that one additional dollar injected. So there is an evidence that there is a multiplier local economic impact of a cash transfer program. We, the modeling rely on a lot of assumptions, so they do, we, we do a lot of sensitivity analysis. If that happened, if this happened, what will happen? So one of the key uh, findings we found is that the potential, potentially limited by constraint and labor and capital land market by the non-beneficiaries could have an impact 
on the local multiplier effect. In other words, if the net beneficiaries are not responsive to the additional demand that's created, then we might have very less uh, local multiplier effect. So the bottom line is then we need to have a complementary effort with both beneficiaries and non beneficiaries to maximize the local uh, economic mul income multiplier. So the, the last one we did was a qualitative method to complement with that. And some of the findings we find from the Ghana uh, Livelihood Empowerment Against Poverty Program is that uh, we, we found food consumption health top priority among the families and then investing in farmers comes the force. You, you don't expect investment in farming to be the first priority. When they get the cash, they want to invest in food, education and health, and then comes investment in, in farming. And we found also that the increase in credit worthiness of beneficiaries. That means the beneficiaries use the cash transfer program as a collateral to access additional credit. And then we also found beneficiaries to re-enter social networks. They can contribute more now, they enhance risk sharing and expand coping mechanism. And we found also that the local economy is to be, uh, be stimulated, more diversified, good available, enhanced labor market, uh, and so on. So let me come to the final remarks. What we could say is that cash transfer programs are, in most African countries, are increasingly linked to uh, complementary productive activities. Even if cash transfer program is not meant to promote productive activities, even if they are originating in the social sector, we have been seeing impacts in the livelihood and the local economics of families that foster re re resilience. And another punchline I'd like to uh, say that to, to maximize the effect of local economy, it's very important to pay attention to constraints faced by the non-beneficiaries too. The non-beneficiaries need to supply goods and services so that the beneficiaries can buy and then there's no inflation and you could uh, see the local economic impact. And then at finally, what we want to do with our project is then, uh, the, the, the final goal is we like to provide direct assistance uh, on impact evaluation design we plan to provide inputs to the policy process on ongoing program implementation. And we are involved also, like I said, in the tran transfer project community of practice. We had a meeting uh, in 2011 in Kenya and Ivasha, and also this year in, in February. We collected both the policymakers and the academician, and they sit together, and we discuss both the scientific one and the policy one, and how to link both, of, uh, both together. And we had a very successful meeting in both of the cases. So we would like to contribute to the policy debate, understand the overall contribution of cash transfer program to poverty reduction, whether it's a cost effectiveness. Cash transfer is one policy instrument. There is a bunch of policy instruments one could use to reduce poverty. So, And then we will look at the polit political economy and also articulate a, a vision or a strategy to use cash transfer as a part of rural development strategy. We also help and cont we contribute to the program design. As I said, most of these programs are not designed with productive dimension in mind. Most of these programs are designed for social uh, objectives, purpose. So we kind of generate evidence on how households spend, invest, save. That would help strengthen design and implementation. And then finally, we try to link to graduation strategy. I mean, we don't expect these families to receive cash for years and years. They need to be a graduation strategy where they exit the program and they are on, on their own uh, and then lead to a better, uh, a better life. So that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Please, please stay a bit. Thank you for a very good, robust overview. Um, I was just wondering if you could elaborate on this issue of conditionality uh, in general. Um, uh, you spoke that there are soft conditions but strong messages, but mo mostly it's unconditional. Um, when there are conditions, in, in what way? Um, you don't, we, do, we do not see in, in, in many countries where there is condition. One of this happens in Kenya and OVC. They try to, with the soft condition, that they send them a message to the families uh, that they need to send their kids to school. But there is no, if they don't do that, there is no punishment for that. Uh -huh. That's what makes like soft condition. In the, in the case of Latin American, if they are not complying with the conditionality, if they don't sit there, it's good, and they're not, not receiving this cash. Mm -hmm. In the case of uh, African countries, there's no, there's no consequence for not complying with that soft condition. 
but it's in terms of messaging. You send the message. You need to send your kids to school and so forth so that you kind of encourage them to, to get engaged. But if they don't, they, they, there is no consequence for that. That's what meant. Thank you. And another thing you mentioned in the beginning of your presentation of, of some of the obstacles is that there is still missing consensus among national policy makers. Could you elaborate just a little bit on that? I mean, if you talk to the policy maker in a given country, there are some policy maker who promotes cash transfer as a very good strategy to promote, uh, to reduce poverty. And there are some other policy maker who really resist this idea. Uh, that cash transfer will create dependency and it's not a good way of using resource. You don't give fund out and, and, and so forth. So there is no consensus generally that every, most of the policy makers agree that this is a very good instrument. You see still in many countries these things implemented, but if you talk to the policy maker, there's every time a debate about whether this is the appropriate instrument. And another question is whether they are willing to use some of their revenue that they have and then devote to this program because there is a limited amount of budget they have. So maybe we'll discuss in the panel later. Uh, but that's another big problem. Another Pardon what? That Say it again? The revenues or what? Yes, the revenue is a key, a key aspect. If there is no donor involved in that, there is no significant amount of donor money involved in it, uh, they are not willing to allocate most of their GDP for this social cash transfer program. Generally, we see in African countries about about, uh, I don't know, about 1% of the GDP allocated so for social protection program, about 3% of uh, the, the, the spending they have allocated to social protection. So some are reluctant to ad allocate that money. They would say, we better invest that money in an alternative program. They mm. might argue that another policy instrument could be more effective to mm. reduce poverty and so on. So, uh, I mean, generating this evidence, like our objective, primary objective is by generating evidence in a much more scientific and very robust way, you could make the case to the policymakers, look, you use this program, that's the impact we are looking, the local economy. The, so they would be much more convinced than to, to promote that policy. Without having an evidence, it's very difficult to make the case. Okay. Mm -hmm. And one last final question. You said that some of the, well, in one of the countries you saw that uh, there was a, a gender effect that women were engaging in, in non-farmer uh, activities, such as what? Like running their own food stalls or? Yes. Yes, non-farm activities are mostly like small businesses. Mm -hmm. So in our model, when we collect data, we have a very model that details capture the non-farm activities. That means not farming, but non-farm activities. Small business, they could engage in but trading. income generating. Income generating mm -hmm. activities, correct. Okay. So we found those females a very strong impact on that. They start to engage in small business activities. But that was only in Kenya, right? That's in Kenya. Oh, yes. that's we, did not we did not finish analysis. Now, this is like a preliminary uh, finding we have. We are still establishing a baseline now. The uh -huh. program, most of the program started. So we established the baseline, and after three years, we're going to follow up, and then we would have much more strong evidence uh, out in two years' time, something like that. That's what we call the second generation of impact evaluation. The Kenya, the Malawi is like a small, uh, small analysis we did so far. So, um, yeah. Okay, thank you for now. He will be coming back in our okay. panel. Thank you very much.